Well, we got some folks joining. Uh, it's a little early on the West Coast, as you know, not a lot of Silicon Valley meetings start at 8 a.m., uh, but we do have folks who who are going to join from all over the world. And um, let me see what time it is. It's uh, it's uh, we're a little bit after eight. Yeah, we're getting getting up to 8.05. So maybe we can jump in, Tony, and then we'll have folks join as we as we roll along. Um, we're also going to record this and share this with folks. So sure. I think, um, you know, our founders and and entrepreneurs i mean one of the things i loved about the book is yeah you know, it was a lot a lot of books written by very successful people are a little bit of a victory lap and, <laughs> and you know what i mean like mine was a failure lap well yours so much of the book is about how hard it was at general magic and all the different gyrations you went through to figure out nest and so i i i, I deeply appreciate that because i've read a few books where i'm like dude all you did was talk about the good parts. You got to, you know, so I, I, I applaud that. But, um, you know, you've been a great supporter of GGV and a great friend of GGV and somebody, you know, you've done a lot with Jenny uh, throughout Asia and known Hans forever. And so we we thought it'd be fun. Um, everybody who is on this Zoom has a copy of the book. I imagine some folks are just starting to read it. Uh, and I was telling, as I was mentioning earlier, it's, it's, to me, it's a must read for anybody who's a founder or, or, you know, trying to build a career, particularly in tech. Uh, so thank you for taking the time. Sure. It didn't, how long did it take you to write, by the way? So it was, um, start to finish. It was two years, start to finish, but it really was about 18 months wow. of real intense work. It took nine months to figure out the format. Cause as you know, it's not a conventional yeah. formatted right. book. So just to work out those details took oh, six, nine months. Of, you know, iterations. It was, it, was, it was worth it. It was a great. It was, it was yeah, great. it's great. Yeah. Thank well, you. and and as you know, everybody on this Zoom who is uh, starting a company, running a company, an executive company, they they feel all the ups and downs that you talk about in the book. And we thought it'd be really fun for people to hear it live from you. Uh, and um, so thanks, thanks for your partnership, and thanks for sharing all your words of wisdom with the folks on on this Zoom. It, it means a lot. Uh, and Hans, maybe you can talk a little about our history with Tony. Sure. Um, I guess uh, Jenny met you in 2013. Uh, yep. And then uh, shortly after, she and I went to visit you at uh, Nest um, and then begins our, our journey with you. You have come invest with us uh, several times um, and uh, you have come to our annual meeting uh, in Beijing and other places. Um, it, it just, it's just wonderful to have a chance to partner with you and, and have our founders get your words of wisdom and uh, I remember hosting you for our, our next billion podcast uh, a couple of years ago, and that was a lot of fun uh, as well. But today, nine nine six, nine nine six, that was called nine nine six first time. That's right. Um, uh, and, and and you mentioned that in your book as well uh, about you know yes, you want to work life balance, but at a certain point in your career, you also need to figure out what is really uh, what are you passionate about and, and and drill in. And like Jeff mentioned, you you, you in in the book you have um, you have a different format. And the format is very much uh, here are all the things I've learned and, and here are the things I've failed, but his, here's what had led me to something interesting and, and wonderful. And nothing comes easily. You got to pay the price. You got to uh, know when you want to be all in. You cannot do that every single day, but you got to choose. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's the judgment that matters. So my question to you is that a lot of people re read uh, what's what, you know a book about a, a specific framework that works or some, something that they, they did that was amazing. But there's not a lot of mention of how what it took to get there, and for you to do something interesting with with app uh, iPod and, and iPhone, you spent ten years before that, um, try so many different things to make it work, and that's not obvious to people. Um, in the book, you, you said that very well. But can you share that with uh, with the audience? How did you know that you should keep on doing that, even when the rest of the Silicon Valley was doing apps, and you still want to do something with hardware? Well. When, so for me, you know, I don't go with what is the fashion, right? I don't invest with what is fashionable because if it's fashionable, it's already priced up. Everyone else is already going, uh -huh. going there. So it's, it's already like, if you're going to do something new, it's got to be new. And it means a lot of people aren't going to know what it is. Right. And so for me, I always wanted to be on that new area because that's where innovation is, is being, uh, is happening. Right, because if not everyone's doing it, there might be a few really smart people working on it in different in different areas. But at the end of the day, it's not like a mass movement. You know, you create the mass movement. And so for me, I knew that those devices needed to exist in some form or some fashion. And that yes, sure, the internet popped up, and everything was about internet websites and you know content, and then ultimately e-tail and stuff like that. Right. But my passion was that 
I saw the future of general magic. And it was like, that has to happen. So how do we keep working on that? Even if it's not the most popular thing, rethink about the technology that's available as opposed to we dreamed the technology was available at general magic and we showed that, well, no, it wasn't ready yet. So what can we do in the context of the greater vision, but harness today's technology to keep moving on? So for me, it was really that I knew it should exist and that I understood why we failed or understood enough and then kept modulating off of that to then get to, to the trajectory I was on. But I didn't want to just run to go to some other thing that I didn't know anything about because I wasn't really as passionate about it. So I just followed my passions where I thought there were pain and just continued that way, as opposed to chasing the dollar or chasing the trend of the week or whatever. And then ultimately, you know, if you're doing the right thing, everybody catches up to you and you're, you're <laughs> the leader or the thought leader in that space because you've been working on it seven, eight years, right? So think about like quantum computing. Okay, people are on quantum computing. Well, that's been a while now and it's going to keep going and sooner or later, it's going to become really massive and everyone's going to jump in. But right now it's still that early stage stuff. So that to me is like, okay, the technology is not exactly right, but it is does has to happen, right? So when is the right time? And you just stick with it. Now, some people are chasing the money really fast. And then as investors, you have to worry about your LPs and their returns. And so you have to follow some trends on certain things. But as an individual, you can go and learn about something and work on it early enough that you can stick with it and then see it as it develops and be an entrepreneur when it's ready to go and learn from others in the space and really be the, really the, like I said, the thought leaders around that. So when it does come time, when it is inevitable, right? Just like climate change. I've been investing in climate change for 10 years. Nobody, nobody cared. Everybody cared about it in 2006, seven. Then 2008 right. happened. It was crickets. Right. Then I started kept investing in it in 2010, all the way through until literally just right during COVID and nobody cared. Now right. everybody cares. And why? Because I knew it had to, it, sooner or later, the mentality said it was, you know, it was an inevitable thing. And now all of a sudden companies are calling me, you know, uh, uh, VCs are calling me and going, what do you got in the portfolio? We need something like this. How can you help us? And so now all of a sudden you're a thought leader, but no one cared for the longest time. So it is lonely being an innovator, especially on things that are not trendy, but that's okay because you're if you're doing it for the right reasons and you're on the right track, more or less, because the real smart people in the industry are working on it still, then you just have to bide your time and do the best you can. And then all of a sudden you are that at the pinnacle of that um uh, of that field. And yeah. it's, you know, and nobody can catch up with you because you've built that network and everything else around it. So it's called investment, right? It's, it means investing your own time in something you really believe in and don't to get deterred from that. We, we try to give some advice to uh, our um, y younger professionals, whether it's the founders or executives or, or uh, investors. But everyone went to a top school and went and got a, a, a great first job after, after school and the resume looks amazing. So all they want to know, most of them want to know is that how can I succeed? What what's what's cool? What's hot? What's going to be the next trend? Give me the magic bullet. And, and I'm, I'm going to do that, do that very well because everything in my life up to this point, I've done what's hard, whatever thought was the right thing to do, and I nailed it. So tell me because tell they me, think me, there's me, a me. formula. They think there's a formula. Okay, if I go to this school because everybody says that's the school to go, Stanford, MIT, you name it, right? Right. You pick to NTU, whatever you want to pick. So. Okay, so I could do that and I follow this path, but it's the end of the day, when it comes time for life, there is no script and you can <laughs> follow the trends, right. but that's not the, to me, like I said, the trends, you're already getting into it beyond, past it. What I always find is what am I curious about and what do I want to learn? And that's how I hire people too. I want to know what are you curious about and what do you want to learn? Not what do you want to do? Not right. what, yeah, there's obviously do and value you can add, but I want, I care about what you're curious about and what you're learning or what you're doing outside of your normal day to day. What is that thing that's really impassioned you, you're impassioned about? And so I care about that. And that's how you should think about your career because that's what's going to drive you at the end of the day when there is failure, when there is these things, because it's just the process of learning. If you're, if you're always into the next trend and you're looking to get the money, then and the money doesn't happen, then you just hop to another trend. And, and it's never fulfilling. It's not fulfilling some deep desire to learn something, right? And so you have to start from the curiosity side and the learning side. Then you might find the things that you can stick with for the long term, even when everybody else is, you know, I always zig while other people zag. 
Right. It's I, if nobody's there, it's probably and I, you know, it's like I said, there's enough smart people over there. It's not everybody's there, but enough smart people over there. Then I think I'm going at the right on the right uh, right path, even though everybody's over here. And so I, that's the way you have to think about your career. Yeah, Tony, I, I mentioned earlier one of the things I loved about the book is you cover so much beyond you know everybody thinks of you as this incredible success story with nest but you cover so much and wind back the clock all the way to the early days of your career and it reminds me you know we have a lot of founders on this call who are running companies for six seven eight nine years before anybody really notices and starts to give them credit in the media and venture capital and all these other things and you know we always joke about the overnight success stories you know these big <laughs> outcomes that take 20 years to build yeah so it takes years to build an overnight success yes exactly totally. Can you just talk about, I, I love the fact that you took the time, you mentioned it took you 18 months to write the book. You took the time to go back and analyze the moves that you made early in your career, the mistakes that you made that then led you to all the success at Apple and, and, and the founding of Nest. Maybe just a couple of thoughts you'd share with folks on this call, all of whom, by the way, everybody who's on the Zoom, you know, we went through an era in 20 and 21 where people sort of thought we were going to have the truly overnight success stories, raise tons of money generate a big outcome and move on with your life. And it's just not really how things work. It, it's a long game in, in Silicon Valley and, and entrepreneurship. Can you just share a few thoughts there? Well, first, let's just let's be just be clear. Most successful entrepreneurs aren't successful until they're in their mid to late 30s. That's when it, you can see kind of the Gaussian distribution of success. And it really skews between 35 and 45. That's where you see really, yep. and that means it was all of that investment in that time, building up your knowledge, your expertise, building up your networks of people to help you, building up those trust networks who yep. will believe in you and bet on you. It's all of that investment that then you then call in those you know chips, so to speak, right? And say, I need your help now. And people have watched you and they see this and I go, yeah, that's a good person. And yeah, I believe in them. And they've done a great job for all these years, even when there's all the ups and downs, right? You really know people when it's down, not when it's up. Right. right. So you so you have to make sure you understand that these are relationship building exercises. You're building yourself. You're learning all the way. And those are all the investments you're making to actually do something on the entrepreneurial track. I'm not saying you're not going to be successful when you're younger, but the you know what the media loves to do is they love to blow out the things like, oh, they were a 20 something dropout. Sure, but that's lightning strikes too, but that's very, very rare. And we can look at your, you know, all the investments you've done and, and you can see where the, you yep. know, where that curve is and it is there and there it's there for a reason, not just because older people are wiser, it's because they've learned so much mm -hmm. along the way and they, and importantly built the networks, right? Building that it's 50% of your success is what you know. The other one is who you know. So you can leverage and you get over the ego problems of asking people for help. Right. You got to ask people for help. A lot of times I don't want to be seen, you know, like imposter syndrome. I don't want to be seen as not knowing. So I got to have to know everything and do it all myself. And I can't talk to a board and ask them for help. And because then I'm not I'm not a real, you know, a real executive. I have I'm projecting something. I'm faking it till I make it. You know what I mean? So it's having that inner confidence to know that you can tap that network and acts and have mentors or coaches around you they can do that so it's all of those things necessary to to do it and understand that failure if you're in the right environment is the way you learn because if you're innovating there are no experts if you're truly innovating mm -hmm. there are no experts in what you're trying to do and so therefore you can't call in experts to help you because people have expertise but what you're trying to do and building something no one new and different you need to pull all this expertise together to then go out and figure out what you're building. And yes, you're not going to get it right the first time and you're going to take iterations and that's okay. But you can't, you have to understand you're going to embrace failure. You're going to have pivots. You're going to have adjustments along the way. And maybe that first venture or the second venture doesn't pan out, but it doesn't mean you should stop. Failure only really, you can only define failure when you fail and you stop. If you fail and you continue, that's called learning. Love that. Well said. Um, and another part of the book that was fascinating uh, to me is that it, because you're so into, you're so willing to figure out a way to build a device that's cool as useful to a lot of people, you were willing to go to a Philips, go to a, a corporate side, um, massive companies, um, and then that's, you know, antithesis of Silicon Valley to do it. That's the extreme you're willing to do it. Uh, it goes everything against who you were at that point in time, after four years as general ma magic. 
Uh, yeah, I had never worked for a big, massive company. Exactly. And if given your, your own personality, your own style, you probably knew that's not going to be a great fit, but you did it anyway. Yeah, because, you know, look, it's a very different funding environment in 1994 5 for hardware and consumer yeah. electronics and how you went to retail. Nobody, Nobody in their right mind was cabinet. funding that, right? So if I wanted to build it and I wanted to prove to myself I could build it, I had to take those kinds of chances, right? And I could learn and I learned what a big company looked like and the problems with it, also the benefits of it. So it was a big learning experience. And I got somebody to say, yes, I'll fund you and you can run your whole thing. And I was 25. I never even managed, really managed a person or a team myself ever before. And this person's like, you're now CTO. You're going to build an <laughs> engineering or you're going to build a device. And I had no shred of like credibility, I, you know, evidence that I could do that. They just said, sure. So when you find those forks in the road and, and because of the environment around, now it might be different now, but thank God I did it then. Yes. And, and it was inside that environment. But the thing that I should express is I've only taken one job that was cookie cutter in my life. And that job was General Magic. I said, give me whatever job you got, I'll take it. Every single position I had afterwards, I architected, created, and then built something around it. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I was never given a job or I didn't take a job someone gave me because it was, yeah, that was a job description. I went, pitched the idea, say, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to build. And I got to make my way, whether it was at Apple, at Philips or my own companies, it was always, I'm creating my position and I'm filling it with me and I'm going to build something. And so everybody should think about that when they go for, you know, whatever positions they have, they want is that they shouldn't always just be taking cookie cutter. They should be saying, I can provide this value and I can provide these ideas and bring this to you, not just what you think you want. I'm going to bring you what I know you're going to need, right? And let me show you how. So again, I never took anyone else's job after my first one, which is at General Magic. I created my own way. Yeah. You know, but you also mentioned that a lot of people come out of school wanting to do something uh, massive because they're taught to be a leader. <laughs> um, but you know, how, 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 how could someone know here are all the skill, steps and the skills I need to learn before I can actually realize that vision of that the mission that's possible, but you know, without knowing the details and learning the steps along the way, it's not possible just to make that happen immediately out of school. Be in an environment where there's lots of growth so you have opportunities to move up, to be in management and leadership, and there's good leaders there that you can learn from and meme from, right? And they in their training. So if you're an individual contributor and you want to go up through the ranks, you need to go with people who know what they're doing so that you can learn from them, right? And you can meme them. And then hopefully if it's growing fast enough, you have an opportunity to say, oh, I'll take that first job at management if that's what you want to be, or you want to be a tech lead or whatever it is. You should be somewhere where it's growing. So you have the opportunity to grow along with it and challenge yourself and always make sure that the management or the leadership know that this is where your track is and that you really believe in the mission they're on, but I want to grow with it. And I want to challenge myself. What else can I do to make sure that you see me as that next rung up the ladder, so to speak. And that means having conversations, not about your job, but having conversations about the product or about the team or about, you know, much broader things than your day-to-day -day work or the team's day-to-day -day work. That's the way you, you move up the ladder. Um, because then people go, Oh, we'll give them a shot, right? We'll give her a shot. Yeah. Um, 20, because at the end of the day, I wouldn't be sitting here if people didn't give me shots, right. right? People had to believe in me and you have to give them some reason to believe in you. One is, are you willing to do it? Do they think you're asking the right question? They seem smart enough and like, okay, we'll give them a chance. And like, hey, give me a chance. Give me four months in this position. Let's see what happens. And, you know, and make sure I can talk to you back and forth. And if it doesn't work, I'll take a step back. But give me, give me a shot. Give me a shot, coach. Put me in, you know? Let me, let me show let you what I can the do. Other let me take the other end of that spectrum, Tony, and sort of build on that, which is, and you, you mentioned being a, a learner and being able to ask for help. And, you know, you've invested in over 200 startups, um, you know, now over the last decade, and, and you work with a lot of really exceptional founders. A lot of the folks that we work with who are founders and CEOs are trying to develop themselves as leaders and as CEOs. You were a CEO, you were a founder, you also worked with some of the greatest CEOs of our generation. Um, what advice do you have for folks on how to stay sharp, how to improve their own skills, on how to scale? I mean, as you mentioned earlier, many folks uh, who are running, you know, running 500,000 person companies are doing it all for the first time. 
What what advice do you have and what do you see the best founders doing on that front? Well, there's a few things. One is you got to be you got to be just inhaling information. You got to be inhaling information from all kinds of disparate sources all the time. So you have to keep your knowledge up and know your competitors and know adjacent spaces and and really g- be in, you know, have those at your fingertips. You shouldn't just be delegating the team to then to bring up. You really have to have a, a good grasp of that. The other thing is you need a mentor. If you don't have a mentor slash coach, and I'm not talking life coach and work-life balance. I'm talking an operational coach who could tell you about the human aid. And that's why the book is that the book is supposed to be like that first kind of operational mentor slash coach, mentorship in a box um, kind of thing to give you those Okay, someone who can help cut out the noise because you can read 25 different books and of the, on management, but they can all be conflicting. So yeah. it's like, okay, who's going to cut down all that noise yeah. and say, no, look, these are, I can very quickly give you a summary. Here's what won't work with these things because I've seen it. Here's what I think will work. Here's what I've tried in the past that did or didn't work to help you refine that, that optionality so you can get to, okay, I'll make this, this decision, this decision, because you can get quickly into, as a manager, you want to do it or a leader, you want to do everything as best as you possibly can, but you can get into analysis paralysis. Yep. And you need someone Sometimes it could be a trusted board member, but a lot of times it's a mentor who's by your side, who believes in you and vice versa, doesn't have a real financial gain, you know, so they're, but, you know, they're just not hired help, you know, like a coach is a mentor who can, you can have a sounding board who you can trust, who can help you with those operational details and and separate the wheat from the the chaff, so to speak. So mentors and learning, that's another thing, you know, and then obviously you gotta, you gotta, balance your schedule somewhat so that you're not a hundred percent always on your day to day because you need to be delegating so that you can have time to be external, to get gain perspective of what you're trying to do. If you get too much tunnel vision, then the board becomes the CEO because they're seeing what's going on outside and you're not doing enough and they're going to keep challenging you and you're going to be like this. So you got to make sure that you're delegating enough and learn that process and that way to delegate and that's trust is a huge issue right i see so many first time leaders like i know i could do it better i'm like are they doing the job are they doing it well enough yeah but i know i could do it better than them it's like, <laughs> guess what so true you know you can't do that there's no way you know you could give them some tips but after that if they're getting the job done is getting the job well enough done yeah. okay so be it but if they're not you you can't be running all this stuff at once and the thing is most people most ceos when it's hard when it gets tough, they regress to the thing that they do the best, mm-hmm. as opposed to what they need to be doing is embracing the things that they do the worst at, and they go and learn about it and then work on those things and let the people who are, they know already doing a great job, don't try to do their job. Don't do the thing that you're really good at, because you should be in a position where you've delegated the things you're really good at, and so you can work on the things that you're not good at and try to figure those things out so you can really start to to build a mastery of all of these different disciplines as a CEO. Not like you're going to be a, 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 a huge like you know expert in the field, but you'll have enough working knowledge and you'll be able to understand each of the bits and pieces so how all of the all the functions fit together. So when it gets hard, don't regress doing the stuff that you're good at. Go do the stuff you're not good at. And most people, that's not instinctual because they want to go back to somewhere safe when it's tough. You just offer great advice uh, on what a CEO uh, should be doing uh, during tough times, including you know uh, going through uh, COVID. Um, on the other end, we, are, we our founders got to be uh, mindful of the fact that people join them for a reason. They need they need to learn. They need to be able to grow. And so that's even more important than uh, the compensation. I mean, it comes, it's definitely important. You mentioned that in the book, but give a chance people to learn and grow so they can be a better version of themselves while working here at this startup extremely important how, how do you how did you uh figure out how to manage a, a larger team and once you in phillips um you were 25 year old you started managing more people how did you know how to do a lot along the way get better and better and better at it any other tips that well you first of all I, I said in the book very clearly i was a horrible first time manager <laughs> right <laughs> so i just sucked at it right i was micromanaging it was You're just bad and so I had to go get a coach to help me. I had to go do my own personal work to figure out my 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 insecurities. Like I was doing micromanagement. And I was yep. trying to, like I was saying, I was regressing and trying to do the thing I was good at instead of the other thing. So you have to gain perspective on this and you need outside people to help you become a better manager. 
But let's say you're in management and you want to, or in leadership and you want other people to do this, then you have to bring in coaches for them, just like I had to bring my own in for me to help them learn. And what you want to do is as the company grows, you want to, you want your best people to grow with you. Right. The worst thing is when you don't have somebody that, and you didn't, you didn't do the good job of trying to, to get them up a level yep. and you've inserted somebody new in between them. And that right. has happened but you have to at least give that person a chance or make sure that they really understand what they're what they really want to do cuz some people say they want to do this stuff but when they do it they really hate it right so there's a lot of people who want to have a level up but then they when they start doing it, they go i don't like this this is not what i assumed so you have to make sure they're educated on what the job looks like so that they really believe in it and do they have the help if they do want to do that to then can can flourish even they're going to make mistakes of course but then they're going to be able to have that sounding board of somebody to help them level up um so you need to invest in your people if not and if everyone sees that there's just always people coming in on the top they're like why am i here right so your job is not just your business growth but it's your team growth because that's the only way you really grow because that that institutional knowledge and that dna how the culture works is inside those people. And you want them to come with you all the way to the top. Because if you insert new people, you get different DNA, different ways of thinking, and they don't have that history or that stature with all the people that were already there, the relationships, that trust building, that it, it, it really puts a monkey wrench in the system and can slow you down. You know, typically when you put in a new leader, a new director or something like that, it's usually six to nine months before they're really in the seat, assuming they're good, mm -hmm, because right. they have to, people have to learn them, they have to learn about the teams, da 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 da, yeah. da. So there is this kind of, natural air gap you hit. And so you're not as effective as you could be during those nine months is if you would have spent six to nine months before working with the people out there, figuring out who could be those ones who could level up with coaches. You know, you have the coaches doing the assessments, working with you, working with them to make sure it's a good fit and everything else so that you can start to grow, you know, and, and maybe it's only a three month gap or a two month gap, but it's much better than always bringing in new people. And then, um, setting the wrong tone for the the other people who are like oh there's no growth here they they do they never trust me so the only way and i talk to people all the time the only way people are going to give me the chance is if i leave here and right. say i'm worthy and then they'll go okay i'll give you the chance yeah. right so you you should always if if it all works out if it all makes sense you should give the people on your team a chance to try and make sure they're they're in the right environment to support them at at their at that at their personal goal you have a special section in the book that I, we haven't we haven't seen anywhere else. <laughs> Keep point in between. I know Jeff has a very good question for you. I'll let him ask that question. Well, I, you wrote a whole chapter on assholes, and I just thought it was. It, I wrote rewrote it eight times. <laughs> eight times. Okay, I'll for, start for, eight for, times. for those uh, who haven't read the book, Tony goes in depth about the different types of assholes that you were you encounter in your career, and I just thought it was really. I mean, Tony. I, not to not to blow too smoke much smoke your direction, but you created one of the greatest consumer products of all time, the Nest. And I loved reading all the thought and process and how hard it was to build that product. But you devoted an entire chapter to assholes. Tell us why and what drove that. And uh, to me, it's it's a very memorable chapter because any of us who've worked in many environments, we've we've certainly you know, seen all those products. You you just you just answered your own question. So look uh. look. It was the first chapter I, we, I started writing. It was the last chapter I finished editing. And the reason being is because we all run into them. You said it, we've all been there. Yeah. You're gonna always get in, whether it's a big company or a small startup, everything in between, you're gonna run into these types. And you're gonna have to understand how to kind of delineate what mm -hmm. are their motivations. And when you start to feel, you know, you feel that gut feeling inside, like, oh, something's not right here. You need to have some kind of a framework to start right, to dissect yeah. what you're yes. feeling and, and then start to do some, you know, some litmus tests. Like, oh, is it like this or is it like that? I'm going to try this so that, and so this is, you know, this is, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. It's not perfect, but it's a, it's a good outline. The biggest though, the biggest fork is most people, especially uh, younger people today, they're always hearing about, oh, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. Just delegate. Let me run the thing and make me, let me make the decisions. And when they get challenged, when they get challenged, nobody's judging them, but their, ju their work gets judged. They don't like it. Stay out of it. And then they start calling people, those people who challenge them, assholes. That asshole won't leave me alone. Let me do my job. And that person is trying, who's challenging them, is just trying to make sure it's right for the customer. Mm -hmm. They're mission-driven. 
And when those people are driving them and driving them harder, that is an okay type of management interaction. It's when it's ego driven. They're right. pushing you down, judging you instead of criticizing your work, right. blah, blah, blah. Then that is an ego driven asshole that you got to get away from because they're never going to be, you're, they're never going to be working in concert with you. As long as you're doing what they want, the way they want it done and building them up, great. But if it's about, you know, if, if you go against them and say, I want to do the right thing for the customer and they're going against it, that then you're in a toxic environment and you have to get away from the manager. So first you got to understand the motivation of the person who's driving you. And then the second thing is then when you're in those different, when you know that, then you got to understand the different types inside of each of those domains and then how to work with them. And then ultimately, if it is in one case where you just can't resolve it, then you got to, you got to, you got to get out of there and go somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's I really, it's just really important to be able to do that because we all I, I haven't seen one company ever not have somebody like this no. that needs to go no. or or somebody who, <laughs> who really who really matters but is misunderstood. We we want to Tony, we want to leave time for folks to ask questions. Hansa, right. you had an, I know you had another question, but we wanna we wanna make sure we give folks time to ask you some questions. So Hans, maybe you tee up your question and we'll encourage folks. Uh, Amy just posted in the chat. If you have a question. Uh, either raise your hand or, or post something in the chat and we'll make sure we uh, we get a chance to talk to Tony about it. Yeah, my, my question is a side question. Um, you know, in the last time when we interviewed for our podcast, we talked about self-driving cars and you said you will take a while. <laughs> uh, and here we are, you know, 2022, uh, still still going at it. What 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 are the other things that, uh, that, that sort of on your horizon, you mentioned climate tech, what are the things that ex still excite you and know you know is a hard problem but they're much closer to being solved this time. Oh my God, there's so many things on the environment side, environmental side that are so so much closer than most people realize. You know, the hydrogen economy, clean steel, clean cement, um, new, new forms of materials or replacement materials um, driven by non-fossil fuel related um, um, uh, inputs. Um, all of that stuff's great on ag, you know, a lot of stuff, great stuff on ag that's happening. Um, I, I can't, I, you know, there's a, just a whole list of things. What, what's really interesting to me is most of the things that are in the press today are the things that are not working out. Right. <laughs> that are <laughs> so hyped true. too much. Self-driving cars, metaverse, right. right? Like, give me a fucking, quantum computing is great. Don't get me wrong. And people want to do that. But it's still so, so, so early in yeah. that, right? And it's going to happen. Self-driving cars is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and how. People are, you know, they're dreaming too much. Metaverse, I, I've been looking at that since 1988. Okay, <laughs> I've been doing Metaverse. Now it's called Metaverse. Before it's called virtual reality. But since 88. So, so the thing is, go look at other industries and where they have climate emissions or what have you and go after and target that, but you'll find a lot of things with a lot of science and that many of the things we already knew of, uh, how to fix in the 30s and 40s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, just the incumbents won because the, they were just, you know, they were already, there. they were, they had the economies of scale already. So a lot of this stuff is just well-known stuff that's actually coming to, 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 to market again because it's the right time because of oil prices and, and, and emissions and all the other stuff. So I would be much more looking at those things than just what the, the media is talking about. Again, this is that what we had earlier in this discussion, which is don't right. follow the trends. Right. Go look at where the fundamental science and technology is and go latch on and where the problems exist, right? Where are the big problems, where the science and technology already exist to be that just need to be productized. They don't, it doesn't need to be rocket science, you know, back in the lab research stuff. It's really just let's productize or slightly do a little science and productize it to get it out. That's what I say is our really incredible opportunities because we're going to reboot the globe here. We're going industrial yeah. revolution 2.0 I love it. for materials. Every single thing that has more or less atoms attached to it has to change for us to, um, with the processes or the, how we do things has to change for us to meet the climate crisis that we, with our our future, our former generations created for us. Yeah. 